In the early years of the Second World War, the German army under the command of Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party seemed to be an unstoppable force that was destined to march across and control large portions of Europe. Yeah, for a short, bleak time in history, that grim prospect was seen by some as an inevitability, thanks in no small part to Germany's rock-solid and unified leadership. At least that was the perception at the time. But now, through the lens of history, we can understand that those surrounding Hitler were not as loyal as they had once seemed. In total, Hitler survived no fewer than 42 assassination attempts from the first time he began his rise to power in the early 1930s until he eventually took his own life roughly 15 years later. Some of those plots were no more advanced than a lone gunman looking for the perfect opportunity to strike, while others required the careful planning and coordination of hundreds of people. Today we're going to take a look at this dark time in history and discuss some of the more well-known plots as well as how and why they failed. In the early 1930s, during Hitler's gradual rise to power, there were no known concerted efforts made against his life. However, there were several lone wolf attacks. The first came in 1932 inside the Hotel Kaiserhof in Berlin, when after eating dinner at the hotel's restaurant, several members of Hitler's staff became inexplicably ill. It is suspected, although unconfirmed, that an unknown person intentionally poisoned the group's food. Not one person died during this attempt, and Hitler was one of those least affected, as it was the meat which was poisoned, and Hitler was known to often forego meat in favor of vegetarian options. Then, on February the 9th that same year, a letter arrived addressed to Hitler, but it was intercepted before it could reach his hands. The letter had been filled with poison, and had been sent by Ludwig Asner, a German politician living in France. The following year, Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany following a series of narrow political victories by the Nazi party. Hitler's constant push for greater and greater power eventually culminated in what is now known as the Night of the Long Knives. If there was ever any question as to what type of leader Hitler would be, those questions died that night. The Night of the Long Knives, also known as Operation Hummingbird, was a series of extrajudicial executions that were ordered by Adolf Hitler as a way to eliminate political opposition, further consolidate power, and firmly establish himself as the undisputed German dictator that we all know him to be. It should be noted that the term Night of the Long Knives is actually a misnomer, as the killings took place over the course of three days from June the 30th to the 2nd of July, 1934. During this time, political opponents, specifically members of the SA and its leader Ernst Rom, were given mock trials in which they were only permitted a single minute to defend themselves. Others were not even given that, and were instead taken out back and shot outright. Officially, death estimates were reported at 85, although that number is now believed to be in the hundreds, with some estimates reaching as high as a thousand. The Nazi Party's justification for the slaughter of their political opposition was the claim that the SA was planning a coup to overthrow the elected government. Whether or not this is true is unknown, however, I suppose it makes little difference in the long run. This singular event inspired several assassination attempts, as is the case uh, with Beppo Roma, a man who vowed revenge after his brother was killed during that short, bloody affair. Roma, along with his associate and fellow conspirator Nikolaus von Harlem, began planning an assassination, but it was uncovered and halted by the Gestapo, Nazi Germany's secret police force. Roma was imprisoned at Dachau concentration camp until 1939. After his release, he immediately began working to overthrow the Nazi regime, but once again, this new plan was uncovered by the Gestapo. Roma was arrested again in 1942 and sentenced to death. He was executed on September the 25th of September 1944, less than a year before the end of the war. The same year as Roma's original plot in 1934, we see what is believed to be the first organized attempt by a large group of people to take down the Nazi party. It was perpetrated by a man named Halbert Milius. Milius was the head of an opposition political party, the Radical Middle Class Party, who commissioned 160 men to infiltrate the Schustafel, Hitler's private squad of bodyguards, more commonly known as the SS, to monitor and report back Hitler's movements. With this information, Milius hoped to eventually organize a plan. However, it was not meant to be. The Gestapo seemed to be everywhere, to know everything, and all 160 men were eventually identified and imprisoned. Milius himself avoided incarceration through his many political connections, but he would never again have the chance to make another move against the Fuhrer. In 1936, Helmut Hirsch, a member of the Combat League of Revolutionary National Socialists, more commonly known as the Black Front, planned two bombings, the first at the Nazi headquarters in Nuremberg and the second inside the building where the anti-Semitic newspaper De Sturmer was being printed. Once again, this story ends the same as the last two. The Gestapo knew 
everything. On the 20th of December 1936, Hirsch traveled to Nuremberg by train but was arrested inside his hotel room. Hirsch was charged with treason, and at 6 a.m. on June 4, 1937, he was executed by decapitation. Political rivals, vengeful relatives, and foreign agitators, they all had their reasons to want Hitler dead. But what if you were just a regular person who was startled to the core by Hitler's ruthlessness? What if you had lived through the Great War and wanted Germany to stay as far away from conflict as possible? Would you do something about it? Would you try and stop him? Well, a man named Johann George Elsa did exactly that, and he did it entirely on his own. While working as a laborer in Germany, Elsa had grown disillusioned by the Nazis' methods and had become convinced that the party's leadership, Hitler, Hermann Goering, and Joseph Goebbels, all needed to be eliminated immediately to avoid catastrophe. In November of 1938, Elsa traveled to Munich to Bergerbrauchhalle Hall, where Hitler was scheduled to give his annual speech on the anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch. This was where, in 1923, Hitler had launched the coup that would see him imprisoned for eight months and fined 500 Reichsmark, a very lenient sentence for an attempted government takeover where 20 people were killed. Although Elsa was unable to enter the room during Hitler's speech, he was able to move inside once the crowd had dispersed. As he approached the podium, he noticed a large pillar situated directly behind where Hitler had just been standing. At that moment, Elsa committed himself to planting a bomb inside that pillar that would be detonated during Hitler's speech the following year. Elsa's preparations began almost immediately. In April of 1939, he started a job at the Volmer Quarry in Königsbrunn and began learning about explosives and gradually stealing small amounts of blasting cartridges and detonators in order to build his bomb. Four months later, he used these stolen supplies to test prototypes at his parents' secluded orchards. He alleviated their worries by telling them that he was just testing out new inventions. In August, he left for Munich with the explosives tucked away in the false bottom of his suitcase. After arriving, he rented a room and began regularly eating inside the Bergerbrauchhalle. Once his meal was complete, Elsa would excuse himself, sneak his way into the adjoining hall where the speech would be held, and hide until the doors were locked at around 10.30 p.m. After all employees had left the building, he exited his hiding spot and spent the next four to five hours working by flashlight to hollow out the backside of the pillar. Once his work for the evening was complete, Elsa loaded the debris from the dig into his suitcase and hid himself in a storeroom until the doors opened the next morning. He would then exit the building as if he were just another patron, dump the contents of his suitcase off-site, get some rest, and prepare to return the following evening. Elsa estimated that he did this approximately 30 to 35 times before the pillar had been sufficiently hollowed out and the bomb placed. With everything now in order, Elsa waited patiently for weeks until the night of November 7, 1939. Then in the early hours of the morning, he set the timers on his bomb, exited the hall one final time, and boarded a train to Switzerland. That evening, Hitler arrived on time and prepared to give his speech as scheduled. However, due to the fact that fog had been forecast for the following morning, he decided to return to Berlin directly after giving his speech that evening. To accommodate his last-minute change, his speech was moved up by 30 minutes and cut from the planned two hours down to one hour. Hitler ended his speech at 9.07 p.m. and exited the hall. Elsa's bomb exploded 13 minutes later at 9.20, killing seven people and injuring over 63. The roof of the building collapsed directly over the speaker's podium, and everyone surrounding it either died in the blast or was crushed by the rubble. Had Hitler delivered his speech as scheduled, he would have certainly been killed. The following day, after learning from Goebbels of the attempt on his life, Hitler is reported to have said, A man has to be lucky. Elsa was arrested at the border and sent to the Sachsenhausen concentration camp. He was executed in 1945, two weeks before the end of the war. At the beginning of 1943, the war was still in full swing, and Germany had suffered multiple crushing defeats at the hands of the Allies. Around this time, many high-ranking officials became increasingly convinced that victory was impossible. This belief was further supported by the devastating losses at Stalingrad, during which time the Axis powers suffered upwards of 860,000 casualties. The effects of the war were not lost on the German people, as they grieved for their fallen sons, brothers, and fathers. But most never publicly questioned Hitler's leadership. After all, the Gestapo were still there. They were still waiting around every corner to strike at the first sign of dissent. And it was only those individuals with access to privileged information that truly understood just how desperate the situation was becoming. For this reason, Major General Hennig von Treskow, a veteran of the First World War and early supporter of the Nazi Party, who was also revolted by the Night of the Long Knives, began to build an organized resistance. 
It wasn't the first resistance, but it would eventually grow to be the largest. For years, Treskar worked in the shadows, gathering intel and organizing teams that infiltrated the SS, the Gestapo, and nearly every military office in Germany. And on the 13th of March, 1943, he decided it was time to make his move. On that day, Hitler was scheduled to visit with the Eastern troops, a visit that was long overdue as it had already been delayed several times. Because of Treskar's military rank, he was in the unique position to arrange an honor guard, a ceremonial guard that would accompany Hitler to provide additional protection during his visit. The first plan was to fill this honor guard with resistance fighters who could overwhelm and arrest Hitler as they moved along a remote stretch of road. However, Treskar knew that wherever Hitler went, his SS bodyguards followed. For this reason, the plan was eventually scrapped, as it was thought that the SS would not surrender willingly, and Treskow did not like the idea of German soldiers fighting other German soldiers, as he thought it sent the wrong message and painted the resistance in a bad light. The second plan was to simply kill Hitler outright. No tricks, just a straight-up assassination in front of everyone. This plan was to be executed during Hitler's midday meal, when he would be surrounded by dozens of other officers. For this to work, Treskow arranged to have several resistance members seated nearby with instructions to stand and unload their pistols at a predetermined signal. It was a suicide mission, of course, but there were many officers who would more than willingly give their lives to end the war. Unfortunately, as lunchtime came and went, it became clear that Hitler did not plan to make an appearance. The men finished their meals and moved on with their day as normal as if they hadn't almost committed high treason. With their window of access quickly closing, Treskar made one final attempt by arranging to have a bomb planted on Hitler's departing plane. The bomb, a plastic explosive disguised as a gift box containing two liquor bottles, was gifted to an officer that was traveling on the same flight. The timers inside were set to allow plenty of time for takeoff, and the bomb was loaded into the cargo hold. Treskar watched as the plane departed and then returned to his office to wait anxiously for the news of Hitler's death, although that news would never arrive. Hours later, the plane landed as scheduled, with no signs of damage whatsoever. The bomb had failed to ignite. Upon learning this, Treskow reached out to a contact in East Prussia and arranged to have the package collected before it could be discovered. When the bomb was inspected, it was revealed that the blast cap had frozen over while the plane was flying at high altitudes. Hitler had survived three assassination attempts in a single day and he was not even slightly aware of it. Undeterred by their failures, Treskow conspired for one final attempt during that year. The following week, on March the 21st, Hitler was scheduled to tour a display of captured Soviet weaponry. Colonel Freer von Gerdsdorf, yet another member of Treskow's resistance, was assigned to guard Hitler throughout this exhibit, and when he realized that he would have direct access to the Fuhrer, he offered himself as a suicide bomber. That day, Gerdsdorf loaded his pockets with explosives from the failed plane bomb, and when Hitler arrived, he slid his hand into his pocket and activated the 10-minute delayed fuse. For the next several minutes, he guided Hitler around the exhibit, never once leaving his side. As the minutes ticked slowly away, Gersdorf tried to stall Hitler at every chance. However, the constantly time-constrained dictator rushed his way through the entire presentation in only eight short minutes. After embracing Hitler in a long hug and wishing him well, Gersdorf excused himself to the restroom and managed to defuse the bomb with only seconds to spare. So now we get to what is by far the most well-known plot, the one that almost works, the one that could easily demand an entire video onto itself, the July 20th plot. The plot centers around a man named Klaus von Stauffenberg. Stauffenberg was born in 1907 to German nobility and spent his formative years in Germany during the First World War. After the war ended, he, like so many other Germans at the time, felt that the Treaty of Versailles was unfair and placed undue blame on Germany. In 1926, Stauffenberg joined his family's traditional regiment, the 17th Cavalry, and was later made a second lieutenant and sent to the Prussian Staff College, where he studied the ever-advancing weaponry of the time. Although Stauffenberg had originally voiced support for Hitler shortly before his election to Chancellor, he never officially joined the Nazi party, and after the Night of the Long Knives, he became vocally critical of the party's methods. After participating in the Battle of France, Stauffenberg was appointed to the organizational department of the Army High Command, which oversaw the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. It was at this time, while witnessing firsthand the treatment of Jews in the summer of 1942, that Stauffenberg reportedly said, They are shooting Jews in masses. These crimes must not be allowed to continue. That year, Stauffenberg was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and sent to Northern Africa to join the 10th Panzer Division as its operations officer. During this time, Stauffenberg was seriously wounded in a bombing raid that cost him his left eye, his right hand, and two fingers on his left hand. As a result of these injuries, he was forced to spend three months in hospital in Munich and was awarded the Wound Badge and the German Cross in gold for his repeated acts of bravery throughout the war. While recovering from his injuries in southern Germany, Stauffenberg was approached by none other than Henning von Treskow, and it was at this time 
that he became fully associated with the German resistance movement. Although to say that Stauffenberg simply became associated with the movement is not entirely accurate, as he quickly became one of its main driving forces. He provided organization to the scattered and irresolute resistance members who, up until this point, have been unable to formulate a concrete plan of action. It was during this time that the July the 20th plot was born. To understand the plot, it is essential to understand that everything revolved around something known as Operation Valkyrie. In short, Operation Valkyrie was a contingency plan that allowed for the activation and mobilization of the German Reserve Army to eliminate any domestic threats caused by a labor uprising, mass protest, foreign invasion, or any other thing that could potentially destabilize the country during the war. Stauffenberg's plan was to activate Operation Valkyrie and use the German Reserve Army to arrest and imprison the highest ranking members of the Nazi Party and replace them with resistance members. Then, with a new chain of command established, they hoped to negotiate an immediate ceasefire and bring a swift end to the war. It was a decent plan. However, there were several major things that stood in their way. First, the only person capable of ordering Operation Valkyrie, besides Hitler himself, was Colonel General Friedrich Fromm. Fromm was somewhat sympathetic and aware of the resistance, but he was not at all associated and certainly would not participate in the coup if asked. That meant that he would need to be tricked into ordering it. Second, Stauffenberg did not believe that the German Reserve Army would willingly turn against the Nazi Party so long as it was still led by Hitler himself, as they had all taken the Führerried, also known as the Führer Oath or Hitler Oath, a mandatory oath that pledged personal loyalty to Adolf Hitler himself. That meant that if Operation Valkyrie was going to work, Hitler needed to be dead. That leads us to our third and final problem. Hitler was still very much alive. Now, there are a lot of moving parts here, and the plan went through many different revisions. So let's just explain step by step what the final plan was. First, Stauffenberg and Treskauer would organize the assassination of Adolf Hitler. Then, as soon as Hitler was verifiably dead, they would convince Friedrich Fromm to activate Operation Valkyrie under the false pretense that the SS had assassinated Hitler and were, at that very moment, in the process of committing a coup to overthrow the current leadership. It was a bluff, of course, but they hoped that, given the urgency of the situation, Fromm could be convinced to unwillingly participate before putting two and two together and realizing that he was actually assisting in a coup instead of preventing one. Once Valkyrie was officially in effect, they believed that the soldiers in the reserve army would be highly motivated to remove the SS under the assumption that they had betrayed Hitler and their own country. They hoped to use the reserve army to round up and imprison the SS, quickly install themselves as the new leaders of the party, and, as planned, end the war. It was all very complicated, and it required the cooperation and coordination of dozens. However, if they could pull it off, Germany might yet be saved. But, as I said, the entire plan was centered around the idea that Hitler would die. Hitler's death would be the starting pistol, and once things were in motion, uh, there was no going back. Therefore, whoever they chose to be the assassin had to be absolutely sure that they could get the job done. On the 1st of July, 1944, Stauffenberg was appointed Chief of Staff to General Fromm. It was at this point that Stauffenberg found himself in a very unique position. As chief of staff, one of his new duties was to report on the combat readiness of the German reserve army, and this report was given directly to Hitler himself. That meant Stauffenberg would be having regularly scheduled face-to-face -face meetings with the Führer on a weekly basis. This put him in a very good position to be the trigger man, and it was decided that if no other option presented itself, he would both carry out the assassination and manage the coup. This added an entirely new level of complexity to the situation and further reduced the chances of success. But if that was what had to be done, then that is what would be done. On July the 18th, Stauffenberg and Treskal began hearing rumors that the Gestapo had been made aware of their plan and were making arrangements to have the entire group arrested. Uh, this turned out to be bad intel, but that made little difference. A fire had already been lit, the walls were closing in, and the timeline of the plan needed to be accelerated dramatically. Two days later, with a renewed sense of urgency, Stauffenberg boarded a plane carrying a briefcase that contained two one-kilogram blocks of plastic explosives. Upon arrival at the Wolf's Lab, Hitler's Eastern Front military headquarters, Stauffenberg requested that he be allowed to change his shirt before meeting with the Führer. It was a hot day, and he had visible sweat lines under his arms and around his neck. Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel agreed and allowed him to use the washroom in his office. At half-past noon, Stauffenberg entered the bathroom and began arming the bomb. 
However, due to injuries on his hands, this was a tedious process. Using his good hand, Stauffenberg inserted and armed the pencil detonator in the first bomb, but he was interrupted by a guard knocking on the door before he was able to arm the second one. In order to avoid suspicion, Stauffenberg quickly placed the single-armed bomb into his briefcase and exited the bathroom. With this briefcase in hand, Stauffenberg entered the meeting room, where Hitler and roughly 25 other high-ranking Nazi officials were all surrounding a large wooden conference table. Hitler stood at the center of the table, and Stauffenberg placed the bomb underneath, just a couple of meters from Hitler's legs. After several tense minutes, Stauffenberg was notified of a telephone call that required his attention. This phone call had been arranged ahead of time or was part of the plan. He exited the room, pretended to take the call, and immediately left the building. Minutes later, at 12.42, the bomb detonated. The entire building shook violently, and a cloud of black smoke billowed into the air. Seeing this, Stauffenberg assumed Hitler had been killed and boarded a plane back to Berlin, where he would set the plan into motion. Unfortunately, he was three hours away, and by the time he reached Berlin, word had arrived that Hitler had survived the blast. Stauffenberg phoned Treskow to inform him that Hitler was dead. But by this point, Conflicting reports had surfaced, and the conspirators were not sure who to believe. Eventually, at 4 p.m., a decision was made, and Operation Valkyrie was activated. The coup was officially in motion, and for the next several hours, Germany would be plunged into chaos as everyone tried to figure out exactly what was going on. The German Reserve Army was mobilized as planned, and believing that Hitler had been assassinated by the SS, military leaders in Vienna, Prague, France, and all across Germany began disarming and arresting prominent Nazi leaders. This confusion and chaos continued for several hours. Hundreds died fighting one another in the streets, each believing that the other side was complicit in a coup. Finally, at around 7 p.m., after learning of his supposed death, Hitler made his reappearance. Word quickly spread that the Führer was alive and well, and the entire plot quickly came to a crashing halt. The fallout from this event was massive, and there's no way we can even begin to list everybody involved. The homes of suspected conspirators were raided, letters and other correspondence were seized, and in the end, more than 7,000 people were arrested, and nearly 5,000 of them were executed. In order to cover up his knowledge of the resistance, Friedrich Fromm ordered that Stauffenberg be killed immediately. Stauffenberg's last words were, Long live our sacred Germany. That same day, Hermann von Treskow committed suicide by grenade. Before his death, he is reported to have said the following, The whole world will vilify us now, but I'm still totally convinced that we did the right thing. Hitler is the archenemy not only of Germany, but of the world. When in a few hours' time, I go before God to account for what I have done and left undone, I know I will be able to justify what I did in the struggle against Hitler.